All right, so hidden Markov models. Um, I'm going to go through this uh, as, as slowly as I can, in part because the material is somewhat new to me uh, as it is to you, and uh, there isn't as much detail as I would like in the slides. I think in some respects, professors don't realize this, or lecturers, I should say more generally, don't realize this, but I think they often give better lectures when when the material is relatively new to them and they haven't given it a bunch of times because they don't tend to skip over as much stuff and they can relate to what the students are struggling with because they haven't already figured it out and gone through it a bunch of times. So I don't know if this is going to be better or worse than some of the other lectures, but, um, but let's just go through it. So um, I've already made a, a number of disclaimers. I have not actually used hidden Markov models. Uh, I know people who <laughs> use them. Um, and I use them very successfully, and in fact, um, most of this is based on reading I've done from a couple of references. One of these is a book that was written by Andrew Fraser. Uh, he used to be a professor in the System Science Department and, uh, and taught a number of courses for us for many years. He was also uh, had an entry in the time series prediction competition that Dr. Wan participated in um, uh, many many years ago now, and, uh, and did his entry based on a hidden Markov model approach. And there's a number of cool things that, that come about from this. Um, the first reference, the references are given at the end of the slide, is from a tutorial that was written in 1989, and it's actually really good. It's really accessible it's by someone named Rabner, uh, and it's an introduction to hidden Markov models. And if you've survived this class this far, I, I don't think you'll have any trouble reading that article, understanding it, and even being able to code these in if, if you wanted to. So um, one of the things that I've done differently in preparing these slides is I've sort of mapped the notation that are commonly used for hidden markup models and tried to put it in a notation that's more similar to what we use. And I've got some comparisons and contrasts that I'll, I'll make uh, it to continuous state space models as we go through this but I'm mostly following Ravner with some, some modifications to the notation so that it would be more familiar to you and you wouldn't have to um, try to adapt. All right, so just as a refresher on uh, what we've done this term, uh, we've been focused on um, continuous state space models uh, where the state evolves over time with some according to some process model that is affected by process noise, uh, as well as what the previous value of the state is. And the measurements that we observe, these could be vector valued, um, are related to the state by some nonlinear function, possibly, and uh, are also affected by uh, so-called measurement noise. Both the measurement model and the process model can change over time. They don't have to be uh, they're not constrained to just being time invariant. So there's a lot of flexibility um, in these models. And in fact, there's nothing to say uh, that X of N and Y of N uh, and the models themselves couldn't be discrete. We've only talked about the case where they're continuous. Uh, but since we're now talking about hidden Markov models, which considers a case where you've got a discrete set of states, um, you could think about using the same continuous methods that we've talked about, but there's some gains that you get from using the hidden Markov model approach, and there's some things that you can do in the discrete case that you can't do in the continuous case. So it's not just like, well, let's just have a discrete state space and discrete measurements and, and we're done. We can do everything a hidden Markov model can do. That's, that's actually not quite true. There's some additional things you can do with HMMs uh, that you can't do with these and vice versa. So there's there's not a, a sort of, one is not a generalization of the other. And um, one of the standing assumptions for the continuous uh, state space models that we've been working with all term is that they're Markov. So one of the ways of expressing that idea mathematically is that the probability of the state of time n plus one, if you have all the previous and current observations and you have all of the previous and current value of the state, is just equal to the probability uh, of x of n plus 1 given the state. This contains all the information that the past states have and all the information that is contained in the measurements up to the current time step. So um, this is one aspect of the Markov property. And then we had a similar property for the measurements in that the measurements 
if you know what the state is at time in, uh, then adding the other information of the previous states and the previous measurements doesn't give you any additional information, and this probability is the same as this one. So that was the, the key Markov property. And one thing that will change in this lecture is that um, as graduate students in an engineering program, one of the things that you're learning to do is not only uh, is to design and exercise good judgment, and a lot of that comes in designing the model and tuning the model. And so the engineering aspect of this engineering course really comes down to the model and process design. Designing those two, uh, they look like they're just simple equations, but as you know, they're, they're multivariate and complicated expressions, and it can require a lot of work to design, to, to design those, as well as the statistical properties of the noise that are, are driving both of those. So that's where the design, the engineering element, was really heavy in this course. It's not really so much in the math that we've spent a lot of time on, because a computer scientist could code that in. Um, but, uh, but doing the design of the, the models where a lot of the engineering uh, comes in for this course. And I'm going to use an abbreviation that I haven't used elsewhere in this term because it was the only thing that we talked about. I'm going to call, for, for this lecture, what we've been working on all term, continuous state space models to um, draw contrast between the discrete state and what we're working with. And uh, the single problem, really, that the entire course has been focused on is how do we estimate the statistical properties of either the state at a given time or a trajectory, uh, a sequence of states or a trajectory, uh, given some set of measurements. And I've, I've tried to be very general here. The set of measurements may be from 0 to 10 in plus t, where t could be in the future, or t could be 0, or it might even be n minus 1, where you're doing a prediction. So there's um, a range of observations. But for a sequence of observations, estimate either the trajectory or um, the state at just a given time. That's what the entire course has been on until today. I'll review. Um, hidden Markov models are different in a number of respects. Uh, the first thing is that the state is discrete. Um, so what that means is that at any given time, there's in x possible states that the system can be in. So um, as an example, and I'll, I'll go through a few examples in a minute, but is, um, um, is one example might be what word uh, is, is being emitted or, or sensed by whatever your measurement is out of a finite vocabulary of words. So if you've got a hundred different words uh, and only one can exist at any given time, then the word that is being spoken, say, uh, might be the, uh, what, what state your, your system is in. So that's, that's one example where this might be used. Um, another big difference is that the measurements are discrete. And at the end of the lecture, I'll talk about how to generalize that. But for now, for understanding hidden Markov models, it's best to consider the, the sort of most basic and, and common case where the measurements that you make are also um, discrete. And these measurements are different than the state itself. Uh, usually what you're measuring is, is a different entity than the state, just like we've seen. Um, instead of having a process model driven by noise and a measurement model that also is affected by noise, instead what we have in a, in a discrete case is transition probabilities. So instead of noise and some model where there's sort of a deterministic element and a stochastic element, in this case we're just looking at probabilities. What's the probability that you can transition into one state, uh, given the previous state was some other values. You can think of this as a matrix. And if we've got nx possible states, then this, this set of a's is nx by nx. You've got that many numbers that characterize what we've been calling the process model. But instead of having a process model, now I've just got a matrix of numbers. So it's a little bit different. Similarly, we have a set of probabilities for a given state We've got a set of probabilities uh, that we can see each one of the possible measurements that we can take. So, um, so we've got another matrix that is uh, nx by ny that is equivalent to our measurement model. But instead of noise and having to do design, 
Now we've just got a set of probabilities. Does that make sense so far? Um, so if we have these parameters, uh, if, we've, if we know what the A's are and we know what the B's are, then we've completely defined the hidden markup model. And this is very different than what we had with a continuous model uh, because there's, there's no concept of noise, there's no design really so far that has gone into getting the process model or the measurement model to be just right. We don't have these complicated nonlinear dynamics that we have to deal with. Instead, we've just got two matrices of probabilities. It's more like a, a linear uh, state space model that is time invariant. We've got just an a, a, a F matrix and an H matrix, although even that is more complicated because then you've got noise properties and covariance matrices that you also have to worry about that in this case we just don't have. It's much simpler in that respect. Um, and it's also more limited in that uh, you'll notice that there's no time index here. There's no notion that these probabilities can change over time. And that, I think, is one of the biggest differences, aside from the discrete continuous, between hidden Markov models and the continuous state space models that we've seen. That these models, um, at least as, as I've read about them, and the main algorithms that are used for, for doing estimation with these algorithms, rely on the notion that they are uh, time invariant, that these probabilities do not change over time. Um, so um, B sub i of k, is that the i continuous function of B of k? Well, given that the state of the system is, uh, is in state i, then this is just the probability that your measurement will be equal to the kth possible measurement that you can make. So those are discrete as well, the k's? Uh, k is discrete yeah, okay. and i is okay. discrete, that's right. Uh, in this lecture, i, j, k, l are all discrete indices that essentially represent uh, one number of a, of a finite set that represents either a, a measurement or possibility or a, um, or a state possibility. Yeah, so there's nothing continuous here at all. And um, because both of these are probabilities, they're both strictly non-negative, and they're more constrained than, than you might think. If, if you think about this matrix, you think, well, that's a matrix of non-negative numbers that is nx by nx, so there's nx squared free parameters. But we have some constraints. Because they're probabilities, if you sum over all of the, um, all of the possible states, um, that you are... So both of those should have been double sums? I do this right. I'm sorry? Both of those should have been double sums? No, they're supposed to be single sums. If you sum across the columns, uh, then it's got to add up to one because that's the... I remember this. Because if you're in the state I and you're going to the state J, you've got to go to at least one of the nx states as you move ahead. So if you say, what's the probability that from i you'll go to state 1, plus the probability you go from i to state 2, all the way through, that's got to sum to 1, because it's got to go to some place. The probability that you're in at least one of those states is equal to 1. This is just like doing a, an OR operation. And likewise, for all the measurements, for a given state, you've got to observe something. And one of that them one should have summed to 1. I'm oh, sorry? Should have summed over k. Oh, right. This can't be j. And this should have actually been k. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. You should make a note of that. First draft of the notes. So I'm sure that won't be the only error that we come across. And then uh, there's also a set of initial state probabilities, just like we have with the continuous case, where before you've made any observation, when you're initializing this thing, you've got to, um, you've got to have some probabilities of, of where the thing starts. And so there's also a set of initial state probabilities. So I, I misspoke earlier when I said all you need is the A's and B's. You also need these, these pi's. And I wouldn't normally use pi, uh, but uh, it's common in this literature, so I... I did to represent those probabilities. Oops. Um, 
So, uh, are there any any questions on on this set of ideas so far? Okay, I'm sorry I didn't have time to share any figures um, in this. So let me give uh, one example of just a discrete Markov process. So in this case, imagine that you've got three possible states corresponding to the weather. And the weather is, we're going to declare it as either being uh, either raining or snowing, or it's overcast or cloudy or it's sunny. And let's just say that we can declare that the weather is one of those three things. And let's say we've got these as our state transition probabilities. So, um, so as we sum over the columns, as we talked about before, this should sum to one if you were to sum over the columns each way, not over the rows, but over the columns. And with this, as soon as we have this, now we can calculate um, lots of different uh, things from it, even without talking about a measurement model, or even just assuming that we could observe things. So, for example, one of the things you could figure out is to say, let's say that we know that day one is sunny. So at times we're, we're given the knowledge that that was a sunny day then what is the probability that this week you're going to observe over the seven days, the seven following days, that it will be sunny, sunny, rain, rain, sunny, cloudy, sunny. And, uh, and you can go through and calculate this relatively easy because it's a Markov process. If we know what the previous state is, then the probability of the next state is only conditioned on that previous state. And so we end up with just a product of the seven transition probabilities representing each of the seven transitions, keeping in mind that we are given the knowledge that we're starting off with day zero effectively being a three. So it's almost like there's a, a prepended three right there. If you go through and calculate that, then you can easily calculate the probability of that sequence. And this doesn't yet get us to estimation, but it starts to give you an idea of how the model works. What I, what I prefer is um, a better way of understanding the type of model uh, that is being conceived here is to imagine that you've got um, n sub x urns. So we've got these balls, or I'm sorry, the balls. We've got these big containers. Uh, the example that I drew this from said so they're glass and that they were chosen by Genie. I didn't understand why that was a necessary part of the uh, example, but uh, let's say that we've got, um, we've got these big containers and there's n x of them. And each of them contains a very large number of colored balls, but the balls are in the urns in different proportions. So you may have 100 red balls and 10 blue balls in one urn, and you know, the opposite ratio in another urn, and maybe a third urn contains a bunch of green balls. Um, and we've got n sub y distinct colors uh, across all the urns. So according to some random process, uh, whether it's a genie or a monkey or <laughs> I don't think it matters, an urn is selected. As long as they're consistent across time, uh, they've got a way of selecting an urn. And the way they select this urn may depend on what the previous urn was. So those are the state transition probabilities. And then uh, someone <laughs> reaches in and grabs a ball out of one of these urns, and what we could see is the color. So we see, oh, that was a red ball, this was a green ball, that was a blue ball, etc. And the balls are put back into the urn. That's an important element because otherwise it would be time varying. You'd be changing the probabilities if you weren't sampling with replacement. So that re with replacement is an important element. And then uh, and then repeat. Uh, and you know I think for thinking about hidden Markov models, this is a really nice way of of seeing, of conceptualizing what the what the idea is, um, what we're interested in, or throughout. This course, at least, what we've been interested in is what's the most probable sequence of urns. That's what's been important to the applications we've been working on. But there are other things you can ask and other things you can think about. So in this model, we're assuming we know uh, what the uh, probability of selecting the next urn is given the previous one and what probability each of a given color for each urn. Yeah, that, that is, those are the transition probabilities and the measurement probabilities, that's right. It would be a very interesting problem to try to estimate the probabilities of colors given urns or something, but that would be a different kind of... Well, we'll, we'll actually get to that, it turns out. Um, this is different. Um, so, yeah, hold that thought, we'll come back to it. And, and I guess one idea that I should have mentioned is when we talk about 
hidden Markov models. We, we could have called our state space models that we've been working with all term hidden state space models because we can't observe the state directly, we just get to see the measurement. It's the same idea here. It's a Markov process, whether it's continuous or discrete, ours were continuous, all term. Now they're discrete, but they're both Markov processes. And in both cases, the state is hidden to us. We can't observe it directly. But instead, some measurement is taken that's related to the state in some way. And, uh, and that's what we get to observe. So the idea of calling it hidden Markov models, that's, that's a term that's sort of stuck to the discrete case. But it's a little bit of a misnomer because that same, the same ideas that underlie that name could be applied to the continuous case. But um, one thing that's quite different, again, to drive this home, is that this is a parametric model in that it's completely defined by just a set of parameters. And in fact, you know, I've defined nx as the number of states, ny as the number of observations. If you could eliminate those from this list, and they're sort of implied, or you could determine what they were if you knew what a and b were. Because b is nx uh, matrix, it's nx by ny. And so, you know, you don't really need this. You could really define the set of parameters that define the entire process is just A, B, and pi. And I'm going to collectively put all those into a set. Um, maybe I should use curly brackets. But in any case, a set of numbers, regardless of how they're ordered. And I'm going to call that set of numbers lambda. So lambda represents the entire model. And we haven't carried around a lambda in the continuous case, in part, because we haven't had uh, models that could be reduced to a set of parameters. When you're talking about an arbitrary nonlinear model, there's an infinite selection of nonlinear models. Even if you're talking about, forget about the dynamics and the noise, and you were just talking about a nonlinear function, if you said, I've got a nonlinear function, that's really a negative definition. You're saying what it isn't, it's not linear, and so there's really no way to parameterize that in general. Um, there are a number of ways of sort of of attempting to model an arbitrary nonlinear function with a parametric function, but they're always approximations. And in this case, this is exact, and what we've been talking about this term is you've got an arbitrary nonlinear function that you have to design or, or somehow extract from whatever generated your data. And in this case, it's very different. In this case, we've just got a set of numbers. And, uh, and it's completely defined by that finite set of numbers. The model's completely defined by them. So it's very, very different in that respect from what we've been dealing with. Just to do some things we couldn't do in the continuous state space model. So with this term, what we've been doing, we've had a single problem, estimate the state. You know, given a nonlinear model, yes, you've got to design it, and there's a lot of math and a lot of algorithms to choose from, but ultimately, we're trying to estimate statistical properties of the state, maybe confidence intervals, um, maybe covariance matrices, error covariance matrices, things like that. But it came down to figure out statistical properties of the state, and everything else can be figured out from that. Hidden Markov models, um, the way that they are taught and discussed in the literature, they say there's three problems here. So instead of the one, they've got three. And this is where things get quite a bit different than doing. Here's the first problem. Problem one. Um, given the, what they call the observation sequence, the sequence of measurements. So you say, okay, we'll go zero to n. Uh, and the model, figure out the probability that you would have observed that, that sequence um, for a given model, for a given lambda. And I look at that, and you know, the first time I looked at it, why on earth would anyone want to do that? You know, it's one of those things where I just scratch my head. That doesn't make any sense. This is essentially, this is in a classical context what's called a likelihood uh, function, where you know, I put a semicolon here rather than the vertical bar. We, we still read this the same way. We read this as the probability that of, of this sequence um, for a given model. So that word given is used in both cases. But the difference here is that I'm not assuming that lambda is a random set of numbers. I'm assuming that lambda is a fixed set of numbers. I may not know what it is, but it's a fixed constant set of numbers. There's no notion that lambda was drawn from some distribution. These are fixed. So I use a semicolon in my notation. And, uh, and this is really, from a classical standpoint, the so-called likelihood function. And this problem in itself isn't actually that useful. To be able to calculate that probability, nobody really cares if you can calculate that probability for its own sake. 
This is important because it really relates to problem three, which is comes back to estimating the model, which is a, a new idea that we have we have not talked at all about this term. So um, stay tuned as to why this is important. We'll circle back to why this is important shortly. Um, we also often uh, neglected this. Whenever we saw a probability like this, we said, well, that doesn't depend on the state, and so forget about it. It's constant, and we don't care about it. You know, for a given set of measurements, the measurements are what they are. You can't do anything about them. You can't influence them. And, it, and this doesn't help me estimate the state because it doesn't depend on the state. So we often treated that as a constant that we immediately discarded and threw out. Whereas with hidden Markov models, they say, oh, no, 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 no. Don't throw this out uh, because this sequence of observations, this probability does depend on lambda. And again, that's going to be important when we get to problem three, which is what you were alluding to. So, um, so this is new, uh, and it turns out that it's, it's relatively easy to do for a Markov process, whether it's continuous or discrete, it doesn't really matter. We just didn't have a reason for, for doing it in the continuous case. So it's really, what is the, the likelihood function? That's the first problem. It's three problems in the same way that it is in the literature. The second one is going to be more familiar. This is about estimating the state. And I've used the word trajectory. They don't, they don't use that word in the literature so much. They talk about sequences instead. So, you know, estimating the sequence of states rather than the, the term trajectory. But it means the same thing. So given a set of observations and a model, uh, what's the state sequence that is in some sense optimal? And uh, this should be really familiar. We've, this is what the entire term was essentially about. Um, there are a number of differences here, though, and I'll, I'll, I'll say more about them in a bit. But one is that we're talking about a trajectory, not estimating the state at a current time instant, but instead, what is the best trajectory? And, and there's an implication here that if you're talking about an entire trajectory, that a lot of this processing is, is done offline or with some delay uh, because they're looking at, you know, you've got these observations and then you want the entire sequence uh, from zero to time in. And so you know, they'll, they'll do that in a batch rather than updating it every single time step. And, and the way that they solve this, it'll turn out, will be very familiar. They essentially use the Viterbi algorithm. But there's, there's more to be said about that. Um, a key difference uh, in, in all of this is that there's no notion of confidence intervals. If you say, <laughs> if you say um, it's earned one, two, or three, and you, you pick the sequence of earns. You say it's earned one, one, and then three, let's say. Uh, and then I say, well, what's, give me a confidence interval on that. It, it doesn't make any sense because you're talking about categorical variables. Uh, you can talk about probabilities uh, when you're talking about categorical variables, but the notion of an interval no longer makes sense, and so that gets dropped. You, you, you don't see that. That's not, not treated. Uh, in the third problem, and, and again, this is my terminology, I'm calling it system identification, when it comes to um, what Jesse was asking about. How do we adjust the model parameters lambda um, to maximize the, the likelihood function that we got from problem number one. So in this case, we're doing model estimation for the first time. We've, we've never done that in the continuous case. Uh, we didn't do it in part uh, because it's so hard. I don't think anyone, hardly, is really doing it. Um, unless you parameter, let me, let me speak for a little bit, for a minute, about the continuous case. In the continuous case, as I mentioned, we've got these very nonlinear models that we're dealing with. And we can cast them and say, we're going to represent them by a finite set of parameters. We come up with this nonlinear model that is described by a finite set of parameters. There are ways of estimating those parameters for that model. Um, but if your model is not flexible enough to represent the real dynamics, then you'll have that mismatch, and it won't work. And in general, it's, it's a really hard problem. There are some good techniques for doing it in a linear case. They're called subspace system identification, and entire um, classes are taught on doing it in a continuous case just for linear state-space models. Um, we may hear a little bit more from Dr. Wan. He's done some work in system identification for nonlinear models, but generally it's, it's really hard. It was just beyond the scope of what we did in this class. So instead of trying to estimate it, 
my advice was um, design it and figure it out um, based on your own knowledge. Um, but there is an alternative approach where you say, if you've got enough data, maybe we can estimate the nonlinear model. And for hidden Markov models, because they're not time varying, you've got this finite set of parameters. And from problem one, if we really can figure out that likelihood function, it turns out that there's a really, if, uh, maybe I shouldn't say efficient, but at least there is a way of, there's a number of algorithms you can use to uh, increase the likelihood function. I won't say maximize, but at least to increase it. And that's, um, that's new. Uh, again, I said design it, and here suddenly we say, if you've got enough data, you can build it. And this is really a remarkable idea. If I said, okay, you don't know how many urns there are, but there's some number of urns. I'm not going to tell you how many. And again, we've got some mixture of balls in each urn. I'm not going to tell you what the mixture is. You don't know what the probability is that you're going to be drawing different colored balls from the urns. You know what the colors are. So you know you'll see red, green, blue, say. But, um, but that's all you know. And you have no notion of this. You don't even know how many states there are. And what people do... And to me, this seems a little bit crazy, but what people will do is say, well, that's all I need. Just give me the sequence of colors. And if that's big enough, then I can estimate A, B, and pi. And to me, that seems astounding that you would be able to do that, that you'd estimate how many urns. Because if there's three urns, there really isn't that much harm if you estimate that there's six. You just guess there's six. And then you run the algorithm and let it go. And it will come back, and it will give you estimates of what those transition probabilities are. I mean, it, it, it will do that. And so there's sort of, from my perspective, what appears to be uh, some magic uh, in this that always makes me nervous. But in any case, there's a cool algorithm for doing it that everyone seems to use. So for problem one, and uh, just a little bit of math, and sorry, my parentheses got dropped there. Um, for estimating the likelihood, I, I think actually all of you in this class could probably sit down and figure out how to do this based on what we've done. Uh, we didn't really do this, we didn't need to, but it's, it's relatively easy to do uh, in the discrete case, and there's a number of ways of doing it. The sort of straightforward way, the naive way, would just be to uh, try all possible state trajectories, uh, and from each one, calculate the probability of the observed sequence, and then uh, calculate essentially how frequently uh, the sequence that you are interested in came up across all those different trajectories. And you'd never want to do this. This, is, this requires, as I've shown here, order uh, n sub x to the power of n um, uh, operations. And it's just, it's not efficient. It doesn't leverage the, the, the structure of the problem. With. So um, the better way of doing this is to work with uh, what's called the Ford procedure that estimates the probability, the joint probability, uh, that the sequence from 0 to n will be what it was, and the state will be in, in the state i at time n. And this is all, you know, I've got the semicolon lambda on all the probabilities because everything is, depends on knowing what those parameters are. And so there's a straightforward calculation for going through and recursively calculating what those probabilities are, what this joint probability is. And um, the key term in this is right here, where there's some i equals 1 over all the states uh, that essentially moves you one step forward. So if we know what the probabilities were at time i, and we know what these transition probabilities are, then we can sum... Uh, the product of those two, and that essentially moves us one time step ahead. Now, one thing I want to point out is in the discrete case, all those integrals that were giving us so much grief at the beginning of the term, and the reason we couldn't do the optimal Bayesian recursions, uh, go away in the discrete case and get replaced with sums. All those integrals become sums, and sums you can compute. They're finite sums, uh, and a finite sum over a, a finite number of terms is way, way better than a multidimensional integral over an infinite range that, you know, you can approximate in low dimensions, but uh, just can't do in high dimensions. So things become way easier when you're dealing with the discrete state, uh, discrete space, and a lot of those recursions you can do optimally, which is ultimately what, what some of these are that we're looking at. So we can calculate, um, at the end of the day, we, at the end of the sequence, we go all the way through and we get up to time n, we get our alpha of time n. And alpha is a little bit different than the likelihood that we're interested in, 
But again, uh, we can do what would have been an integral, a multi-dimensional integral in the continuous case, but we can just sum in this case over all i when we get to the end and essentially marginalize out uh, the, the state. We just calculate the sum over all of those and we end up with the probability that you get that sequence um, conditioned on knowing what the parameters are. So it just goes away. It's just a simple sum to do that. Where again, in the continuous case, that was an integral, and that, that was hard. Um, and in some cases, just completely infeasible computationally. So this is one of the algorithms. And um, I think I just made these points in the previous slide. Uh, this is much better, uh, kind of like the Viterbi algorithm. Because there's a sum for each individual state, we end up with However, whatever the dimension is of the state uh, squared times the number of time steps that we have. This is the order of computation way better than uh, what we had before where it scaled essentially exponentially with time. But again, no surprise. And I think any of you could have come up with that based on what we've done. There's also a backward procedure uh, that calculates something a little bit different. You know, the alphas were given, we're calculating a joint probability of the uh, sequence of observations up to the current time and the state being whatever it is or being equal to i at that same time. There's a so-called beta parameter that's useful for doing what we call smoothing or what we've called smoothing, where it's looking at the probability of the future sequence conditioned up on knowing what the state is at, at time n. And again, you know, again, you got to know what the, the model is. And I didn't take the time to go through and write out the recursions. I, I don't think that would have been as helpful to all of you anyway to try to go through that math. But, um, but there is a backward procedure that's very useful for doing smoothing. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. There's a typo here as well. Um, so we've got, we've got betas. And... Uh, with the alphas and betas, we can very efficiently calculate the gammas. And the gammas uh, are something we're interested in. They're the probability that the state is going to be equal to i, uh, given all of the observations from 0 to n in lambda. And this is a great thing to have. Uh, this is how one way in which we could do smoothing. Here, we could say, um, I'm going to estimate the state at time n is being equal to the most probable, the, the one that, over all the possible finite set of discrete states, I'm going to pick the one that maximizes this over all i effectively, and pick that as your estimate of the state at the current time. And the really nice thing about this, if, if you were to use that approach, is that um, this is conditioned on the observations not just from 0 to time n, but 0 all the way up to n, so all the observations you have. You're not just using the past and current measurements, but you're also using future measurements to help you estimate what the state is at a given time. So this is, is one way in which you can do what's called um, fixed <coughs> interval smoothing. You've got a fixed interval of observations, and you can use this to quickly estimate the state. And gamma, it turns out, is, has a very simple relationship to alpha and beta. And this is some, some math that I did um, to figure out that the equation in, in one of those key references that I'm, I base these slides on is true. It just provides this final equation here at the bottom. Uh, and I had to go through and do the math to convince myself it's true, and I've included the steps here. I won't walk you through the algebra, but I think you could easily follow that math and arrive at the same conclusion. Um, what isn't so clear from this, though, is that if you wanted a causal estimate that's more like what the particle filters, the traditional sort of simple particle filters, and the, um, the Kalman filter, unsent to Kalman filter provide, um, then you could just draw beta and do it based on the alpha. It's not immediately clear, because this isn't quite the same. This isn't x of n equals i conditioned on y of 0 to n. It's, it's the joint. But you should be able to quickly convince yourself that if you did one more step and set this equal to, uh, you know, applied base theorem and said, well, this is x of n conditioned on y of 0 to n, which is what we're interested in, times the probability of y of 0 to n. But the probability of y of 0 to n doesn't depend on the state. 
And so maximizing the joint is the same as maximizing the conditional and it ends up being equivalent. So if you wanted to do the, um, the filtering, so-called filtering problem, um, then you could just maximize this, and this you can calculate causally. So uh, kind of everything is, is right there. And again, it's all based on calculating alphas and betas, which we couldn't have done in the continuous case because there were integrals instead of sums. But in the discrete case, suddenly it's easy. The sum is doable whereas the integral was not. So that's, uh, that's new. And in fact, um, whether we're doing it causally or with smoothing, one of the problems that we never really solved in the continuous case was being able to do it this way, where we say, I'm going to estimate the state at the current time as being the most probable. We, we never saw a way of doing that. The only way that you could sort of wing it is to say, well... I'll do a particle filter to estimate the density, and then I'll do um, kernel density smoothing or some other method to estimate the density, and then I'll find the maximum of that density. So you could have done that, but that's it's heuristic, and it's it's not it's it's much less elegant than most of the things that we've seen in this class. Um, for the discrete case, it's right there. It's straightforward. It's easy. Uh, again, because all those integrals became sums. That was a key thing that changed. So, um, so here we can find the most probable state. We can't talk about confidence intervals. Uh, we can't really talk a lot about our uncertainty of our estimate. Um, but w at least we can get an estimate that we couldn't have gotten in the continuous case. This is not the mean. A mean doesn't make sense. What's the mean of a yellow, a green, and a red ball? I, you, know, I, <laughs> I don't, you can't really combine those. So if you've got to pick... Uh, a reasonable estimate, then, then what everyone does is just picking the one that is the most probable rather than thinking about a mean or a, a mode. Those ideas that only really apply to continuous densities. Um, I think all these other points I've already made. So, uh, as I mentioned, this estimate gets us the most probable state. The most probable state is very different than the most probable trajectory. Uh, it may be that your most probable state, if you look at the sequence of most probable states, that it's, in e that it's even an, an impossible sequence. Um, so when you're thinking about what's the most probable state at this current time, uh, if that's really what you want, then this is what you should use. If what you're really interested in is the most probable sequence of states, then you should use the Viterbi algorithm, which I haven't repeated here because we've been through it before, and it's identical in this case as it was when we went over it for the uh, continuous case. The only thing that's different is that it's way easier um, in the discrete case because the big decision we had to make, and what I talked about last Wednesday with the Viterbi algorithm, is that we had to pick, it, pick where we were going to evaluate it. We, at, at every given time step, we had to say, I'm going to put a scatter of particles here, and, uh, and I'll apply the Viterbi algorithm for the states being here at these particular values. The example I did was easy because it was one-dimensional, and so I just used a uniform grid. Uh, but for hidden markup models, you don't have to do that because the state's are already defined. If you've got 12 urns, then... Uh, then you know, that's your, those are the states at which you evaluate possible, the trajectory possibly going through at any given time step. So you don't have to make that decision. It's automatically made by the way the problem is, is defined. Um, you might think, well, wait a minute. If, if we can do a lot of what we've done in the continuous case with the discrete case, particularly with particle filters, it doesn't make sense really when you're thinking about the common filter recursions, but for particle filters it does. And uh, the answer is that you wouldn't want to do this. If you had a scatter of particles, a lot of them would be redundant. They would be in exactly the same states, and you just wouldn't get anything from it. Um, the Viterbi would be much more efficient. It has essentially one particle in each possible state. It's complete. It works well. I mean, there's really no reason not to use the Viterbi algorithm um, if you're interested in trajectories. And if you're interested really in the most probable state, then you would use these gammas that we just went through. So you've already got a complete set of solutions um, for the discrete case, and, and I don't think you need anything more that we needed in the continuous case. 
And then the third problem uh, is model estimation. And these equations are more than I knew you could absorb uh, in a Monday lecture, especially given that there are so many ideas. Uh, but let me just mention some of the critical points around this. Um, the algorithm is called the Baum-Welch Baum algorithm. I think that's how you say it. Uh, and, uh, and it's cool. People really like it. It uses the forward-backward algorithms as alphas and betas from the previous um, slides uh, and the likelihood from problem one. It's maximize, trying to maximize that. Um, I want to emphasize again that it's assuming that the model is time invariant. I, I think that's a significant limitation, but, um, but there's no notion that it could be time variant that I've, I've seen in this literature so far. Um, a really important point is that this may converge to a local maximum. If you're going to do this, that what the algorithm provides you is it says, if you've got an initial lambda, so you've got an initial model, you think it might be okay, or maybe it's terrible, it doesn't matter. Um, it can take that and your sequence of observations and give you a new lambda that is better. Better in the sense that it has a higher likelihood. So it's an iterative algorithm, and it's an algorithm that can make things better. And it will eventually converge. If you run it enough times, eventually this will saturate, and it won't get any larger, and you'll get the same lambda you did before. It may take a lot of iterations, um, as I pointed out here. It may not be efficient. But an important thing to realize is just because lambda eventually saturates and this stops improving doesn't mean that you've maximized your likelihood. There are local minima in this problem. It's a, um, it's a difficult optimization problem and you could easily converge to a local maximum which means that your set of parameters, the model that you estimate, may not be great. Uh, it may be that if you started off with a different initial model and ran the algorithm again, you would end up with something that's significantly better. So it does have this limitation of, um, of converging to a local maximum, and it's, it's um, known that there's a lot of these uh, that are, are sort of implicit in this optimization problem. So that's one, one limitation of the approach. But it is cool that you can do... Uh, some form of model estimation, which again we haven't seen in the continuous case at all. I mean, this is just outside the scope of what we considered. So do they do random restarts to get past? That is used time? sometimes, is to, uh, well, let's just randomly pick them and then randomly pick them again and again and again. And, you know, you're just using sort of a scattershot approach. I'd, I'm not fond of, of that approach to optimization, but from what I've seen, that's what people who are skilled in the art do. is. Mm -hmm random initialization and then run it and then do it again until and then pick the best. Yeah. And when they're doing this, because uh, it, it, to me it's a little bit funny too because you do this and you say, okay, I guess that there's five states and then you run it and you get a set of transition probabilities and measurement probabilities, but then you also have to do a step where you interpret what on earth these states mean. You didn't tell it they were urns. You know, you just told it there's five states and with some unknown transition probabilities. And there's no natural ordering of the states. You may think there's an urn one, but it may decide that, you know, just by the nature of the way this optimization happens, that your urn one may be its urn seven. Uh, and there's no way to, no obvious way to sort of map uh, what it decides are states into something that, that makes sense to you as an engineer for a given application. So that's something else that you have to be wary of. So if you um, start off guessing that there are more states than there actually are, do you wind up with rows that are close to zero or something? Well, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of heuristics that come in. Uh, in, uh, in Andy Fraser's book, he started to talk about some of the practical aspects of working with this algorithm. You've got this beautiful theory, and then, and then the heuristics come in, and, and you know, they start doing things that are just practical. So one of the things he would do is prune uh, probabilities for both A and B that were less than some threshold. I think he used 0. .0001 as his threshold. He said, well, if it's that small, I'm just going to declare it as being equal to zero. And that makes the model simpler, it's easier to interpret, it's more efficient computationally. And so there are games like that that are, are played, but I mean, it's just, you know, 
a lot of a lot of subjective judgment goes into it at that point. It becomes more of an art than a, a science opinion. Um, I provided a, a little bit of a summary here just to compare and contrast. So with what we've been doing, the continuous state space models, uh, they're continuous, HMMs are discrete, measurements are continuous, these usually are discrete. Uh, it's easy uh, to make the CSMs uh, time varying. I mean, it's really just some notational overhead is the only cost you have to pay. It's, it's simple. Uh, for HMMs, I haven't seen it, especially if you're going to do the model estimation. And again, you could probably clue something together where you use windows or something. I mean, there's sort of straightforward ways to begin to approach this problem, but in its the, the way it's designed, it's not really designed for that. It's designed assuming that it's, it's non, uh, that it's stationary, that it's not time varying. Um, with CSMs, with a continuous case, we didn't talk at all about system identification. You were the system identifiers. Uh, whereas with HMMs, we've got this cool algorithm that does it. And one of the things that I really loved and emphasized about all of the state space methods throughout the class is that unlike a lot of traditional signal processing where you estimate something or you do detection, but you don't have any notion really of how good it is, of how much confidence you have in your estimate. Um, Almost all the methods we talked about, except the Viterbi algorithm, provide a natural way of estimating your confidence. You know, so you estimate the state to be 5, but 5 plus or minus what? With what level of confidence? And you get that, maybe not for free, but it's an, an inherent part of the way these algorithms work. And it's just gone. Not because it's limited by the HMM algorithm so much as it just doesn't make sense uh, in the discrete case. And then... Um, I, I, bear with me for two more slides and then we'll take a break. Um, we talked about the case where the uh, measurements were discrete, um, but they can be continuous, and you can still use hidden Markov models, it turns out. And I was impressed by this. I didn't, wasn't aware of this until I did the reading to prepare for this. And again, there's a missing equal sign there uh, in the slides that should be there. Um, but we can make this work, and the way that they do it apparently, and there's, this M should be uh, subscripted also, I apologize for the typos, um, is that they use what's called a, a mixture model, where you can think of it as drawing, with a certain probability, you pick, let's say, a Gaussian distribution. A Gaussian is unimodal, it's got a, a center, it's got a mean, and it's got a, a standard deviation or a covariance of some sort. This, this could be vector value rather than scalar value, but it's probably easiest to think about the scalar case initially. So imagine that our measurement is a real number uh, for now, just a scalar, and, uh, and it could be drawn from a Gaussian distribution with a certain mean and a certain standard deviation. But I can also instead first randomly select a mean and standard deviation from a finite set of these. And then once I've got those, then you know, I generate the observation based on that mean and standard deviation. And when you do this, you have what's called the, a mixture model, a Gaussian mixture model that Jeff had brought up in one of the earlier lectures. And with the hidden Markov models, um, you can represent your measurements with this kind of mixture model. And it works again even if your measurements are in the vector case. But now you've got these set of parameters of the probability that you're going to pick each sort of each one of your unimodal densities, and then once you've picked one, what the mean is and what the covariance is. And, uh, and that's cool um, that you can do that. I, I wasn't aware of this. Um, and this is a neat way of representing um, if, if really the way that whatever you're measuring is working is that you're getting this continuous vector, this continued measurement, but it could be from one of some number of possible distributions. This is a pretty neat way of figuring out which distribution it came from with a lot of flexibility on the distribution. And just like we were estimating densities by adding up bumps, this is doing the same thing. This is a lot like a kernel density estimator, except instead of the particle weights here, we've got probabilities that are estimated um, as part of the algorithm. So these are, are not particle weights, but it's really the same idea and these are usually Gaussian unimodal distributions that are adding together, but they could be um, anything. They could be heavily tailed if you've got, for example, measurements that have heavy tails that generate outliers on occasion. 
So if your problem is that you're getting measurements that are not a ball, but are real valued measurements that come from one of a finite set of distributions, this is a pretty cool way of figuring out everything. Figuring out, first of all, what is the state? Which of the finite set of distributions was this drawn from? What's the probability of having sequences of those states? You know, everything that you'd like to know. It, it can be applied in that case. It's not just limited to discrete measurements. You can apply it to continuous measurements also. And finally, do, and this is what's used for speech, and I, I apologize, this is where I ran out of time, part of the reason I was late. Um, you can use, um, you can also do this with autoregressive models. Um, in uh, another class I teach, um, Statistical Signal Processing 1, we talk quite a bit about a very powerful class of um, random processes that can be written this way. That's supposed to be a minus sign. So this is effectively, um, if you have white noise that is driving a discrete time uh, model that is what's called all pole. This doesn't have any zeros in the numerator, it only has poles in it. Uh, then you can, so it looks like this. Th this is a really common and a really nice statistical model for signals that you may observe. And it can, it can model a lot of different types of signals. It is stationary. Um, you know, this is not allowed to change over time. Uh, and so this is sort of how we draw the block diagram. And mathematically, all that means is that the measurement at time n is equal to some linear combination of previous measurements uh, plus noise that's driving the whole thing. And, and noise is usually modeled as white noise. We saw this once before with the Kalman filter, where we declared these as being our state variables, and we used a random walk model and ended up with a very powerful adaptive filter. Um, another possibility uh, for using this with hidden Markov models is to say um, these coefficients are, are, there's several different sets of coefficients that could be used to model how my signal is being generated. So you've got a finite set of coefficients that represent, for example, different phonemes, different parts of our speech, for example, uh, that are being generated. And with the hidden Markov model process uh, uh, approach, you can estimate these coefficients as well as the, um, the, the, the states and the sequences of states where each state represents essentially a set of coefficients that, that are being generated. And so there is a way of doing this even more generally, rather than just saying y then is, is drawn from some density, and that density may be completely different than the same at the next time step, to instead say, no, this is some random process that has a set of coefficients associated with it, and I want to know, is it this random process or that random process that represents sort of an ah or an uh, you know, different, uh, different parts of speech, for example, that we have. And, and I still have a relatively crude understanding of how HMMs are applied to speech recognition, but I, I, I think that's how they do it, is using these autoregressive models and having different coefficients of a, of a discrete set to distinguish between the different finite set of things that can happen. So I think that's more or less how it works. So it at least gives you the idea. So hopefully that gives you um, the sort of flavor of hidden Markov models, um, how they're similar and how they're different than what we've been doing this term and what sort of the common algorithms are that are used for working with them. There's things you can do with them. There's things that they don't do compared to the continuous state space models that we've been talking about. So I hope that gives you kind of a nice overview. Do you guys have any, any questions or comments or additions? No? Okay. I'd just be curious about some example applications of it. I, th I think the, this 
speech identification one is sort of clear, um, and system identification I can see a little bit, but I, I'm just not familiar too much with the, with yeah. the HMN literature. I'm not really sure what kind of problems they tackle with Right, them. right. Uh, well, speech is a big one. Speech has really moved this ahead because there you are talking about finite words. Uh, and you've got a continuous signal that you're trying to estimate from it. So it, I mean, it's a natural fit. But what else? Um, I don't know. But the big one, though, again, I don't know all the details. This is uh, genome sequencing. Oh, good. I wasn't actually aware of that. Okay, good. Sorry, that's all I got. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right, well, let's take a five-minute break, and Jeff, then we'll, we'll have you present, and we'll, we'll call it a day.